All right, so today we are going to discuss um, robust convex programming. That is uh, not yet another type of programming. Uh, you remember we have been galloping over all types of uh, new uh, optimization problems, right? From linear to quadratic to et cetera, right? Every lecture is always something new. Even last lecture, we saw a mixed integer. Uh, you would think that is not even convex, right? But it's still a new type of program. This time, it is not a new type of program. That is rather an application, right? Uh, is an application. But uh, it, it is so specific that I think it is it merits uh, its own lecture, especially since it has a very direct uh, use in uh, adaptive uh, or robust control. And also because uh, the technique itself is rather simple and uh, mastering it uh, helps you understand a whole lot of derivations. Even some of the derivations that we have already done, such as the ones that we did when we were starting uh, Chebyshev uh, center of a polynomial or polytopsy and the e, uh, those uh, inscribed uh, ellipsoids. So, so somehow this will be useful. All right, let's see what it is all about. So assume we have uh, the following problem. So we have uh, to find x in R uh, such that x plus y is bigger or equal to 1 where y we know is somewhere in the range where it's by absolute value, it is less than two. Okay. So we don't know what y is. y is not a decision variable. Okay. So y is not a decision variable. That is, uh, here we maybe for the first time breaking one of our uh, typical rules of convex optimization. So let me bring it to your attention. Uh, in convex optimization, we have two types of entities in our optimization programs, constants and variables. We don't have anything else. So if you have a number, like let's say A plus B less than C in the optimization problem, A, B, and C, each of those uh, entities, have two options, one of them be a constant, another one be a variable. There is no third option. You cannot be something else, right? Just constant or variable. Now, uh, here, y is not a constant because we don't know it's not value. And it is not a variable because we cannot decide what it is. So it is not up to us to decide what y is. Someone else can decide it, right? And no matter what this someone else decides, our inequality should hold. Uh, in a, if, if you like those analogies, you can think about it in terms of uh, adversarial games. Let's say you have uh, your decision to make, but you have an opponent that would make his decision. Your decision will be to choose x, such that x plus y is bigger than 1. Your opponent, after you made your decision, will be able to make his decision about what y will be. And uh, you have to make sure that your decision is such that uh, once you made it, no matter what your opponent does, it still is going to hold the inequality that x plus y is bigger or equal to 1. Right? So if you like uh, this uh, idea of adversarial game, uh, you can uh, think about it that way. All right. Uh, now, what, uh, uh, you know, what is uh, your proposal? I think here I probably forgot to. <laughs> yeah. I usually cover, try to cover solutions uh, in my slides, but this time I forgot. My apologies. Okay, I'll pretend we didn't see this. 
so I guess they use so the solution is three, right? But um, uh, can someone explain to me how we get a uh, solution? Some of you guys, please. I think worst case for y is minus two. Worst case for y is minus two. Why? Why not plus two or zero? Please explain. Why not zero or plus two? Let's see. Okay, we, we try to minimize x. Mm -hmm. And uh, the cost function here is in, or the, the the domain is x plus y. So mm -hmm. the worst case for y for for a for y x should be as greater. Uh, how to say it? Uh, mm -hmm. So I I mean y is minus two is worst case for x. If y is zero, x would be smaller. It would be. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, this is kind of like intuition. Uh, you know, it's uh, like you are thinking uh, entirely correctly. Uh, what the way we could talk about it is, for example, to say x is bigger than y, one minus y, right? One minus y. Okay, so this is the domain of x, one minus y. Uh, since y is in the range from minus two to two. That means that uh, we have a range of domains. So let me try to just write it here. We have the range of domains. Um, X uh, bigger than, uh, in case of minus two, it will be one minus minus two. So it will be bigger than three, right? And uh, in the case, uh, the opposite end, so it is linear, so we don't have to like uh, think about intermediate points x bigger than one minus y minus y when y is uh, two would be uh, minus one okay. so this is the range of domains that we get for different uh, values of y so um, in this range of domains in each of those domains we clearly want the left most value of x right so if the domain uh, is uh, starting from three, we will take three. If it starts from minus one, we take minus one, right? Uh, but if we take anything that is less than three, that in the then in the case when y is equal to minus two, uh, we will uh, violate this constraint. So while we would prefer the domain to be like the bottomless one, uh, bottom most one, uh, we uh, have to take the one where x is bigger than three, just because it is one of the possible domains and we cannot ignore it. So that is why the solution is x equal to three. No, great. Uh, is That is pretty much the way to think about it. Now, uh, as you see, we had a little bit of this kind of like verbal stumbling, right? We were tripping over our words a little bit. And that uh, is something that you want to avoid if you want to be systematic. So, uh, you know, the following parts will start to try to be systematic. All right, so uh, let us consider the following problem. Uh, here I'm writing uh, it in this way. Uh, I'm not, this is not standard notation, this is just how I write it. If you can propose to me how standard notation looks like, I would uh, be happy to take it on. Um, yeah, but um, I'm just using, uh, I, I think it is self-explanatory the way I write it, but I'm happy to change. So minimize over X, minimize over X for any value of Y, Right, minimize over x when you value pi. Cost function x norm, so the x should be smallest length, subject to the following constraints. We have a linear, a linear uh, part with respect to x. 
we have a linear part with respect to y. And uh, the sum of those should be less than or equal to h. And we know that y is less than or equal to p. Okay. All right. What is the worst case scenario? Well, the worst case scenario is when this guy here is the biggest uh, y. Well, the bigger this guy is, the smaller, uh, like if we transfer it to the right hand side, the right hand side will become the smaller, the bigger this guy is. So uh, this guy being the largest possible will lead us to have the smallest possible value here. And, and that in turn will decrease the size of the domain, decrease the size of the domain. Right? So uh, you can think about this argument in, uh, in this way. Let's say you have uh, three possible domains, three possible domains. Here is domain domain number one. I'll draw it like this. So this is domain number one. Let's see. okay. So this is domain number two. It is inside the domain number one, but smaller. And here is domain number three. It is inside the domain number one and domain number two, but it is smaller than uh, both of them. Now, if the cost function, no matter where it attains at minimum, there is no way that the uh, value, the optimal cost in the domain number three will somehow be smaller than the optimal cost in the domain number two. Why? Because uh, let's say the optimal point, uh, the point uh, where the optimal cost is attained lies inside the domain number three, then it lies inside the domain number two and one, okay? So uh, domain number three cannot have advantage over domain number two and one because it is included in them. If on the other hand, the optimal cost does not lie inside the domain number three, then it, clear, uh, clear, it is clear that the uh, domain number three will have optimal cost higher than the cost on the domain number two. So uh, there are only two scenarios here. Either the smaller domain loses, so it has the worst, op worst optimal cost, or it ties, so it has exactly the same optimal cost as the other domain. Okay. That, that only is possible because uh, one domain is completely included in the other domain. Okay. If they were different, uh, different sizes, but uh, uh, they have had uh, non-zero store, right? Like the part where, um, like the difference between them. You understand the idea of XOR, right? I mean, I'm not even sure. Like I'm, I should be careful about using words that I don't use so very often. So I, I, one day I will just say something stupid. Uh, anyway, uh, the idea is that uh, you have, uh, how should I even draw this? We have this part here, right? And we have this part here. Like the part that is not intersection, and uh, but it is included in one of the domains. So it is included in one and only one of the two domains. That is like XOR of those two domains. Right, XOR? Uh, or is it, uh, do, do I say something stupid? Is it, am I saying correct things or not? Tell me someone. Please uh, clarify if I'm uh, saying correct things or not correct things. Like this part and this part is what I'm talking about. This will be end. This whole thing will be or. Right. This whole outside would be not, not in both. Um, but I'm interested in this part where uh, the values that lie in at most one of the domains, but not in two.
Did we have someone uh, just missing uh, the uh, the missing the class? All right. <clears throat> Uh, all right. I apologize if uh, I made uh, some of you uh, be late for the class because the uh, late announcement was a change in the time. Don't worry, we are only beginning, so you will catch up if you just touch it. Okay, good. So the uh, this is uh, in this scenario where domains are like this. We cannot make any argument about the mean being uh, definitely uh, lying in one of the domain or another domain. We cannot say that the size uh, has any bearing on where the mean will be attained. Um, so all, the, all our arguments are about domains which are nested inside each other, such as uh, Matryoshka dolls. Okay. That was all I was trying to say. Sorry for this huge, uh, you know, uh, development uh, of the discussion. All right. Uh, so this guy being bigger makes when we put it to the right hand side makes the whole right hand side smaller, and that would mean that the domain for x will become smaller. But it, uh, every small domain will be included in the bigger domain. Why? Or because it is linear inequality. So when we when they become smaller, the way it looks, and I'll let me clear everything. The way it looks is kind of like this. Uh, so let's say this is the original inequality. Uh, and uh, it includes everything like to this direction. Everything to this direction is included in the, in the original inequality. <coughs> Now we make it smaller uh, by decreasing the right hand side of the linear inequality. This line will shift in parallel towards uh, like in the orthogonal direction. Basically, it's not good to change its orientation because C is what defines that orientation. It didn't change. So new domain will be like this, would still uh, cover the same half space, but now it is kind of shifted a little bit. So you can clearly see that no new points were added to the domain, only some were lost. This means that our new domain will always be inside our all the bigger domain. That means, in turn, that uh, uh, what we do is we just decrease the size of the domain, and we can argue, uh, we can argue that um, the worst case scenario is when the domain is the smallest. Because uh, in that case, for the smallest domain, uh, it is possible that uh, like we have the largest uh, part of the domain taken away. So what is taken away here is this part. I just know kind of like this. This is what is taken away. I'm drawing now with the touchpads. <laughs> I apologize for the slowness. Uh, so this is what is being taken away, and this part can contain uh, uh, the uh, minimum of the function. If it contains the minimum of the function x, uh, then uh, definitely uh, this would be uh, this domain would be worse than this domain. All right. All right. So, um, in other words, uh, if we solve for this red uh, inequality here, and we got, let's say, optimal value that is uh, located somewhere here, for example. Um, you know, fair enough, this is optimal value. This would be alpha the optimal value for, uh, yeah, so this is the optimal value, let's say, okay, for this domain. Good. Uh, but uh, you know, solving it for this red domain, uh, we would get a solution that is violate, violating this purple domain. So the purple domain would uh, be violated because this uh, value lies outside of this domain. Whereas if we solve for the purple domain, uh, let's say we solve for 
the purple domain right here, we get the solution right here. This solution will not violate the red domain. So, uh, and uh, we we will never violate any con any uh, constraints. So that is why we always uh, have to look for uh, when we talk about worst case scenario, uh, when our adversary can pick uh, any y that we that uh, you know they want. We always have to look for the smallest possible domain. And in linear, in terms of linear inequalities, that basically means that the right hand side, uh, like right hand side becoming smaller or left hand side becoming bigger because we have less than equal to there. Okay. So left hand side becoming bigger or right hand side becoming smaller. That is the worst case scenario when this is achieved to the limit, to the maximum limit. All right. Uh, I hope this uh, somehow explains it. The worst case scenario is uh, one last time is when this this inequality shifts as far as possible uh, towards the infinity, right? So it's uh, uh, this becoming smaller or this becoming bigger. Okay. Right. Now uh, all of this said, uh, we can uh, start thinking about. Uh, how to uh, find out the worst possible y. So we are thinking about the largest possible d times y, the largest possible d times y. So d times y being the largest leads us to uh, the smallest possible domain. We just spent 10 minutes arguing this. Okay. Now, when is d times y the largest? Well, let us just study what uh, max over d times y is. Well, first of all, this is the same as having a, uh, like this is a dot product. So we replace dot product there, like this dot product. We replace it with um, definition of dot product, which is the norm of the first vector times norm of the factor, uh, second vector, times the cosine uh, between those two. Now, here's the thing. D is a constant, okay? D is a constant. So norm of D is not a decision variable uh, or anything else. It's just a constant. Good. Norm of Y is at most equal to P, at most equal to P. So let me point it out. So norm of y is at most equal to p, at most. Uh, not, nothing stops us from choosing it to be equal to p. So why not? Let's uh, choose it equal to p. Direction of y is not limited to anything. It can take absolutely any direction. So the best possible di direction that it can have is if this guy here, uh, Like if this guy here is equal to what? Can someone tell me? Equal to what? Equal to one. Yes. And when is it achieved? When y and d collide. Yeah, they are when they are collinear. So if d is directed in the same uh, same way as y, or y same way as d, then uh, cosine between them will be one. And nothing stops us from doing that. So this will become one. This will become one. Oh, let me just write like this. Becomes one. Uh, while this becomes pi. So p, sorry. This becomes p. And d stays the same because it is a constant. It had no choice but to stay the same. So that's how we get d norm times p. Uh, that is the dot product. Y uh, itself, the variable, uh, is uh, equal to P times D divided by D, D norm. Uh, where does this D divided by D norm comes from? Well, remember, D dot product D with Y should be equal to D norm times P. Okay, this is um, this is dot product. So. Uh, 
if y is equal to p times d divided by d norm, then multiply this by d, you get d squared divided by d norm times p. d squared divided by d norm is the same as d norm squared divided by d norm, which is the same as just d norm. Okay. Uh, we could arrive to the same conclusion in a sl slightly less intuitive way. We could say y should have the same direction as d, but the uh, norm of one or of p. So same direction as p is given here. Is given here. This is the same direction as uh, d, and norm of p is given here. So this would be uh, passed away to argue. But this is more rigorous because we at least uh, trying to uh, like use uh, math instead of language. Oh. Uh, all right. This is uh, how we arrive at this conclusion. So the conclusion itself is uh, quite universal. We will see it again and again and again. So we see y is equal to p times d divided by the uh, universe. At this guy achieves its uh, maximum here. Good. You have questions about this? Okay. Now, uh, this expression, the result we just did, becomes uh, like that. Why? Well, because uh, remember, we just argued that this achieves its worst case when p or largest uh, case when p is when it is equal to p times d norm. Okay. So we can rewrite our whole problem in this way. X norm minimize x norm subject to x times c less than h minus p times d norm. Notice now we don't have y here. So uh, we achieved it, uh, turned it into a quadratic program. We turned it into a quadratic program. And uh, we achieved uh, a uh, simplification, got rid of const of y, which we couldn't have dealt with before. Because uh, we it wasn't decision variable and it wasn't uh, a constant. Now it doesn't exist in our problem anymore. So now we have uh, quite a uh, quite a simple uh, quite a simple situation here. Quite a simple situation here. Uh, this is how we can transform a robust uh, control problem uh, into a QP. Now, uh, let's just think for a second why we call it robust. Well, see, uh, here I'm asking you to minimize x, but not for one constraint, but for a family of constraints. The family of constraints is parameterized by this parameter y. And y exists in this unit ball. No, not unit ball, p-sized ball. So uh, for all y in this ball, I want the, uh, this constraints to hold. So it is a family of constraints. And this is this uncertain constraint. Uh, I want uh, x to still be minimized while all of them are being satisfied. So uh, that is why it is robust. It's, uh, it, it satisfies the family of constraints, not just one. All right, good. Sounds great. Now we can uh, try one more example. So no questions about the previous one? OK. OK. Now let us consider uh, this slightly more complicated problem. So here we have. Uh, minimization of x minus x star. Mm -hmm. I uh, mostly put it there so we wouldn't have a zero solution uh, as an obvious choice. So x minus x star. 
where what I want is uh, for it to hold, for uh, for it to uh, respect this inequality for any y within a p-sized ball. So this is now not a linear inequality. This is, uh, strictly speaking, a uh, quadratic inequality or bilinear inequality. That would be more uh, appropriate way to describe it, bilinear inequality. So it is a linear with respect to y, a linear with respect to x, but both of them multiply each other. So bilinear inequality. Uh, bilinear inequalities uh, in the constraints are nothing bad, no problem. <laughs> the problem is just that uh, y again is not a decision variable. So we cannot solve it as a QCQP, for example. So we have to find worst case scenario again, uh, worst case scenario. So worst case scenario as before is when the left hand side is the biggest or right hand side is the smallest. So when is the left hand side the biggest? Well, when y is aligned with dx, okay? Yes. I could also just uh, do the same uh, discussion as before. Let's say, what is the max of y dot product with d dot product? I mean, let me, I guess, just quickly write it here. So max of uh, dot of uh, y and dx, okay? What is the max? That is the max over uh, norm of y times norm of dx. Let me try not to break the line. Uh, times cosine between them. Okay, I would just write it as a cosine. As as again as before, cosine uh, can go to one because uh, y can take any direction, and the norm of one y is again p. So the worst case scenario is again p times uh, dx. So this is again the max that we can achieve. Okay. Uh, and this is because uh, this guy goes oh, sorry. this guy goes to p and this guy one goes to one. Okay, good. Now, what do we have here? So uh, here I'm saying that uh, the worst case scenario is when y aligns with uh, dx. So it is equal in the, the norm is equal to p. So this p times d divided by dx, which is the same up here, right? If we multiply this by dx now, we get, let's, uh, let us do that. Here is a description of what happens when we multiply it by dx. So here is y times dx. It becomes dx times dx uh, in the uh, uh, numerator. This is the same as dx uh, squared. Okay. And this uh, guy here can go away if this goes away. And we get just p times dx. So the same as here. So uh, this is how we can argue back that this was the correct choice of y, okay? Because we got the same result as here. Okay, okay, okay. So we have a uh, quite simple situation again. We know what uh, the worst kind of constraint we can expect here. But the worst kind of constraint is p times uh, dx by norm less than or equal to h. That is the worst kind of constraint that we can expect. Good. So the problem becomes, uh, becomes something like this. And we don't need to do anything else uh, with this problem because it is already SOCP, second order quantum problem. 
Uh, however, uh, it's not really a CCP. Uh, can someone tell me what it is? Uh, can we make it uh, simpler than this? I mean, a CCP is actually good enough. Uh, solvers will be happy to make a CCP. But uh, can we represent it as something uh, less uh, like, you know, low down the order of those programs? Can we represent as a LP, QP, uh, anything else? Sound on. I think QPCP. Yeah, QCQP. Yeah, uh, quasi constraint class program. Exactly. Uh, why, basically? I think why? Um, it's a quadratic uh, constraint. Yeah. We don't because... we don't have. Yeah, uh, because this is an ellipsoid, right? Uh, if we, uh, like, this is just an ellipsoid. And the elliptical uh, domain is the QCQP. Uh, this is not a cone. A cone would have a pointy end, <laughs> right? This is not a cone. This is just the ellipsoid. So uh, we can multiply uh, square it. And what we get after squaring it will be x times d squared times x less than or equal to h squared by p squared. So would be a con would be an ellipsoid. All right. And we could uh, even divide them by by this and have a one here, etc. But anyway, uh, good enough. Uh, solvers will be happy if you give them this uh, problem. One more. One more. Slightly more complicated, but uh, I mean, today we are not going to see anything too complicated. So I apologize if the, if the challenge uh, that we usually feel during the lectures is not here. Uh, it's uh, rather simple, all of this material. So but let, let's uh, you know, get through it. So again, I will have a cost function, uh, which is x minus x star, just to avoid zero solution here. Now we have a family of constraints like this, okay, family of constraints like this. And uh, here, as before, what we want to say is that this part here should be the biggest in the worst case scenario. If this is the biggest, the overall uh, constraint uh, would describe the smallest possible half space, the smallest possible half space. Okay, the smallest possible half space. So if this expression is uh, bigger, the half space is smaller. Uh, H will, in this case is not going to change, so it's only this part. Okay. Uh, now. This guy is uh, difficult to work with directly, but we can open the bracket like this bracket. And what we get is two expressions. One expression is y times d times x minus b. And another expression is uh, a times d times x minus b. Uh, the interesting part is that this does not have uh, this adversarial uh, variable doesn't have y, while uh, this guy has a y, and the y is linear. So uh, y appears exactly as it appeared before. So we can argue again that uh, the worst case scenario is when y is aligned with this guy and has a length of p. So that means that y would have to be d times x minus b divided by norm of d x minus b and multiply by p. Okay, so same exact thing as we seen before. Okay. Well then when we substitute this y here, what we get is uh, this y becomes this guy. Let me use a uh, different marker. So this y becomes this guy. Okay. Everything else stays the same. 
and uh, yeah, not to forget B. Everything else stays the same. Well, uh, we can clearly see that here we have uh, again a square. So this will become a norm square upstairs, divided by norm. It is just a norm. Norm squared divided by norm is just norm. So this is how we get this expression here. P stays the same. So what we have is uh, now uh, this norm less than or equal to uh, one over P. The old expression here. I just shifted it. Uh, to the right with this guy. Of course, uh, yeah, uh, so th this guy went here and uh, we divide it by P. Now, this is an OCP, SOCP constraint, now for sure. Why? Oh, because we have uh, here is a linear expression dx minus B. And here is a linear expression, uh, but not under the norm. So SOCP constraint is a linear expression under the norm uh, vector vector expression and a scalar linear expression outside the norm. So classical SOCP. Well, this is a SOCP constraint, and we can see that with this constraint, I'm not sure. Let me check if I have a slide. Yeah. So we get uh, the following program, which is which is a CCP, which is a CCP. So this is an SOCP program, uh, and we can solve it using any SOCP solver. Uh, let us just quickly look back and see uh, see what happens. So uh, we had what appears to be a quite general quadratic function here and uh, parameterized by y but uh, the y is as you can see it's kind of like shifted off center so if we replace this different variable let's say z uh, we can say that y is equal to z plus a okay so um, we, we could have ch shift change it to a different variable and this different variable would be uh, like a off center to y. So it wouldn't be centered at zero, like y is. It will be centered at uh, point 0.8. So somehow we here I managed to uh, use off center parameter. Uh, it no longer is centered at the origin. Uh, this whole thing is centered at point 0.8. And there's still unit ball. N not unit ball, sorry, ball with a radius p. So this is what we have uh, as original problem, and it results in SOCP. So it sounds very nice, it sounds very good. And as you can see, there is a pattern. It always results in SOCP, uh, except sometimes uh, it uh, is degenerative SOCP, so QCQP, for example. And sometimes, like here, it is so simple that it becomes an LP, linear constraint, basically. Uh, yeah. But linear constraint uh, happened because y was not multiplying x. So that was why. Now here is uh, y does multiply x, so the constraint is SOCP. OK. 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 Questions about it? Okay, right. uh, let us consider uh, even more complicated case. Now we will, uh, you know, we will just see a, a few tricks that allow us to make uh, like more complicated cases uh, to, you know, go the same way as the less uh, as less complicated ones. So uh, you know, uh, it uh, a lot of it is kind of like looking the same, but you need to uh, pay attention to the tricks. Very useful. Okay, so we again minimize the same cost function. Uh, subject to exactly the same constraint. So it is again a, a ellipsoidal constraint uh, with uh, like bili bilinear constraint with the offset y, offset x. 
but now we have a different uh, uh, different bounds. So y no longer is a bound by a unit oh, by a p uh, p sized circle. Okay, uh, it's no longer a circle with a uh, radius p. Now it is an ellipsoid. <coughs> it is an ellipsoid now. By the way, since it is an ellipsoid, I have absolutely no reason to keep p here. I could have put one there. Uh, absorbing P inside H and F. I only keep P here to uh, make sure the notation stays as simple as uh, similar to previous examples as possible. But I absolutely have no reason to keep P here. So just take it in mind. Keep, keep it in mind. In this example, uh, it will be sufficient to write one on the right hand side uh, because P can be absorbed inside those matrices and vectors. All right. Now uh, we have this guy, and we assume that H has an inverse. If H didn't have an inverse, uh, we could still uh, work with it, uh, but uh, we'll have to think about it slightly different. Right. And by the way, that is something if you want, you can try to do on your own. Think what happens when H is uh, degenerate, like uh, it misses a, let's say, row rank. Or a column rank. Think about what's going to happen then. Okay, uh, you can think about H being a square matrix or even H being a rectangular matrix. Just think of possibilities. Think uh, what's going to happen uh, with the problem. All right, uh, I'll leave it aside. Now uh, we'll see. Uh, think that H has an inverse, and we now need to deal with it somehow. Well, our first step is. Rather predictable. We introduce a new variable, which is uh, equal to uh, this. I mean, let me use the same color as before. Equal to this. So basically, we just want to make sure we can go back into circles from ellipsoids. So clearly, here we'll have V under this uh, uh, norm. Okay, now we have y equal to uh, h inverse times v minus f. Uh, how did we get it? Well, we get it from here. We simply express y from here. Uh, we put f uh, to the left hand side as a minus sign. Then we multiply it both on by h inverse on the left. And that's how we get uh, this expression. Okay, now this guy, this guy can be substituted here to get us this expression. So here is how we get this expression. Now, next step for us is to open the brackets such that we can isolate V as a li linear function uh, in this quadratic form. So we open the brackets, we get V here. It is multiplied by, as you can see, H inverse minus transpose times D times XB. Like this part, let me just uh, note where each of those come from. This part comes from here. And this part comes from here. Okay. So um, uh, transpose, of course, comes from here. So this is how we get uh, our, this expression. The rest uh, you have basically uh, we put a minus sign in front. So uh, this minus sign is being absorbed here. This minus sign is being absorbed here. So we get H in reverse F plus A transposed and the same D here. All right, so the same D here. Good, 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 good. Next step, next step, 
uh, as a next step, we propose to, uh, I mean, here's, this is just a massage of the same equations. We just rewrite them in this form. What did I do here? Well, uh, I said, let us add here. Uh, this is quite a standard way to do things when you have uh, invertible matrices. So, um, you know, you can pay attention to this. <laughs> Okay. This is one of the tricks that uh, you get taught here. So I, I know that H is a uh, full rank. So I can multiply uh, by, like I can always add H times H inverse in the middle of anything, as long as the dimensionality holds. So as long as uh, the matrices on the right, right and on the left have the correct dimensionalities, I can always just plop this pair of H H inverse anywhere I want. Same about H transpose, H transpose inverse, no problem. So what, that's what I did here. I put a H inverse transposed and H transposed here. But H transposed, I absorbed inside the brackets. So this guy will become F because uh, H transpose when it gets inside the brackets, transpose is left out in this, like outside, because the whole bracket is transposed. So transpose, transpose itself doesn't go inside the brackets. Uh, and here it cancels with H inverse. Here, H, H uh, it just stays. So A becomes this guy, HA. So this is what happens. We just added uh, a pair of matrices here, um, and that's it. You could, if, if you don't like it, you could think of adding a pair of matrices in front of A. You can say we say that A is equal to a, uh, H, H inverse H A, and then H inverse can go outside the brackets and we get the same result. So no matter what you do, the whole point is that you add, uh, replace some identity with H H inverse. Okay, good. Why did we do that? Well, um, you can kind of see why we did, we did that. Uh, because we have here this guy. And we really would want to have the same guy here. And this will, uh, will be helpful. <laughs> this will be helpful. That's why. That's why we did it. OK. Let's see what we have next. Next, we introduce notation. I mean, of course, all nota you don't have to introduce any of this notation. I'm just trying to simplify visually the problem. So we say that H inverse transposed D is equal to M. And we say that uh, HA plus F is equal to G. OK. Now, uh, G is here. It is uh, in front of uh, M multiplies M on the left, we remember. And M is everywhere. M was here, M was here. Now you can clearly see what I was talking about uh, just before. We have uh, the scalaristic form, V minus G times M, X minus B plus the equal to H. But we already solved the problem. Uh, 22 is the problem that we solved before. Uh, and we know what solution was. The solution was, uh, I mean, here is a problem. Solution was uh, SOCP, right? You remember uh, previous one. Uh, it would be it would include M under the norm, etc. So let's just see. This is a problem that we already solved, so we don't have to solve it second time. So solution is uh, is this? Uh, yeah. Well, let, let's just look here. This is a solution. But in, instead of uh, D, we would now have M. Instead of, instead of, uh, one second. Yeah, instead of A, we would have G. So here we would have G. Here we would have M using this uh, notation. So, um, and we would have a CCP. When we open all the brackets, we will get this huge expression, uh, which we don't have to write it out, but. Uh, you know, it is what it is. Okay, 
So uh, this is how we, uh, we can solve it. And ultimately, you know, if you can transform a problem into the type of a problem that you solved previously, I think that's good enough. Uh, we don't have to always transform it all the way back. Uh, we know that we can solve this problem because we did it here. Good enough. Okay. So we transfer problem type three to the problem type two. The rest is just a technique. Okay. Okay. Any any questions about this one? All right. Uh, here is an example of a slightly more challenging uh, problem. Here I added a linear part and the quadratic part. Uh, remember, quadratic part we solved separately, linear part we solved, solved separately, but now I combine them and I get uh, ellipsoidal constraints here. So consider if you want to try to solve it uh, on your own. I'll just double check that I don't have a solution here uh, on the slides. Yeah, I don't. All right, so try to solve it on your own. Uh, if you want, you can submit me a solution. Uh, maybe I'll uh, uh, grade it with uh, extra points. Uh, yeah. But uh, your solution has to be original, as in if you need to identical solutions on the, on the first one grade. OK. Um, but yeah, uh, you can see it's, uh, it's doable. Uh, yeah, but uh, I will be even more interested in seeing uh, you try to solve uh, this problem, where is it? Like this problem where H is the genome. Let's be even more interesting. Uh, yeah, this is fair enough. I know that this is uh, within your powers. Okay. Okay. So you can see we can solve quite a few quadratic uh, type adversarial problems. Now, uh, we, I think we got the technique, we understand how it's done. And uh, this is, all of this is standard stuff in, in robust control. In robust control, what often happens is you have a Lyapunov punch and you have some component of a control law that enters Lyapunov function like this. So in bilinear fashion, like unknown parameters, for example, multiply your uh, some kind of Lyapunov function like this. Okay, This would often be, for example, a regressor, this would be like a uh, what would be multiplying the regressor. Don't, don't want to lie. I think uh, I think this would often be torques. Torques. And this would be parameters, or sometimes this would be torques, and that would be regressor and parameters. In any case, uh, and what you want to say is that this whole thing would uh, have to be less than equal to zero, okay? So um, this type of stuff. Uh, and uh, you would often want to do this, and uh, you would follow basically the same process. So now you understand how it's done. Robust optimization. If you are interested in trying uh, other types of robust optimization, go ahead uh, and uh, you know, uh, give me your feedback uh, in the chat or anywhere. I'll be very interested in seeing uh, if you manage uh, something else as robust optimization. Because you can imagine uh, all we did so far were, was half spaces. If you're interested in the circles or ellipsoids, uh, good luck. I will be interested in seeing uh, how you do. Okay, now uh, let me just show you a few more uh, examples separate from what we did before, uh, which are, I think are also quite meaningful, quite meaningful. So consider the problem, uh, maximize x, or maximize the following function with respect to x. So we want to maximize the norm a plus x with respect to x. Uh, you, you can kind of see where this comes from. 
we were talking about linear constraints before. We were saying that left hand side would be maximizing, uh, uh, right hand side would be minimizing in order to achieve the worst case scenario. Uh, so here, classical example, okay. uh, this would be uh, left hand side of some constraints being maximized. Okay. Where X is uh, as before inside some uh, ball with the radius P. Now uh, we can expand this norm as uh, a uh, definition of a norm. So this thing dot product with itself, which is the same as A squared A plus uh, two A times P M times X plus x squared. Okay. okay. Now, if a is constant and it is constant, then this whole expression attains the maximum. So not the square root, but uh, an uh, expression under the square root attains maximum when uh, this guy is equal to p squared, because uh, this is essentially just non squared. So you know, why not choose it as big as possible? Especially since this would also attain a maximum when X is as big as possible. Uh, for this guy, there, uh, so, uh, okay, let me maybe be more careful. This guy cares about the direction of X. This the guy does not care about the direction of X. Okay, so only one of them cares about the direction of X. So we can choose direction of X the way this guy wants. And both of them care about the size of x, and they want it to be as big as possible. So norm of x would be equal to p, because both of them would prefer that. And the direction of x will be defined by this component. This component does not care about direction of x. So direction of x will be uh, uh, this, a times a uh, norm. Size of x will be p times a divided by a norm. So that this guy would be p squared. This guy would be norm of a times p. Now, all of this is cool, uh, but that is uh, we haven't seen anything yet. <laughs> the true beauty of the problem comes now. So we get this expression, and we substitute it here. Now, of course, we can leave it the way we wrote it, but it is a little bit ugly. Uh, write a norm of a plus p times a divided by norm of, I mean, agnes. Uh, we can uh, get rid of a, uh, sorry, we can get rid of uh, a norm of a. Let me put it, <laughs> let me try to put it carefully. So uh, we see that there is this uh, variable a here. Okay. In front of a variable a, here is a scalar coefficient one. Here in front of a is a scalar coefficient p divided by a norm. So those scalar coefficients, we can uh, put them in the brackets. We would say it would be one plus p divided by a norm times a. And scalar coefficient can go outside of the norm. Okay, Scalar coefficient does not have to stay inside the norm. Uh, so this is what we do here. We put the square scalar outside of the norm. So we have norm of a plus, uh, times one plus p divided by norm of a. But we can now open these brackets. And what we get is, uh, let me appear. Here, it will be a norm. And here the norm cancels and it will just becomes p. So the max of this function, uh, max of this function, is just norm of a that plus p, which somehow somehow makes sense. Uh, somehow makes sense. If you think about it, what does it tell you? It tells you that uh, you have two vectors. They can be any orientation you want, like uh, can point each way. What is the maximum possible value if one of them you can choose any direction, but uh, the size is at most p? Well, you arrange the ones that you can choose 
in such a way that would follow the other. So we had additional vector, you add one more. And the size you make as big as possible. So P. So what is the length uh, of this uh, guy then? Well, the length of the original vector plus P. So somehow the result makes perfect sense. Uh, but uh, we did it with this uh, very cool trick uh, taking the scalar outside the norm here. Okay. And observing uh, that only this guy cares about directions and this guy has the same preference for largeness of x. Okay, okay. Now, uh, what we can do now with this is consider conic constraints. Conic constraints. That is pretty interesting uh, stuff. So here what we have is the same uh, cost function as before, x minus x star. But the constraint now is like this, ax plus b plus y. What does it do? Well, uh, what it does is it says uh, the left-hand side would have to be the biggest uh, for the for the problem to be in the worst case scenario. We somehow here can claim that uh, uh, all those ellipsoids, uh, all those uh, like response are method. And uh, by the way, you know, uh, would be nice to prove it. Be nice to prove it. Uh, that uh, increasing y here does not add any more points to the set. So we, ideally, what we would, we would want is to prove a theorem saying that uh, uh, the smallest possible cone does not contain a single point that the largest possible cone does not contain. Okay, for example, something like this. Now, uh, how can we deal with this? Well, um, this attains maximum when y is, uh, has this form. Where did we get it? Well, from the previous, uh, previous discussions that we had. Uh, we said that uh, when uh, such norm will be the largest, when the, the vector would align the second vector and achieve its maximum length. So the maximum length is p and the alignment is ax plus p. Okay, so the conic constraints become this now, where we can uh, get rid of the scalar coefficient again outside the brackets. This is the scalar coefficient. And then uh, this is what we have. We can open the brackets and we have this guy here instead of one and P instead of this. So it, it again becomes exactly the same as before. It's just the, uh, like the vector under the norm plus P. And uh, here's what we have. And now <laughs> look at how beautiful this is. Uh, this is the same conic constraint as before, but we say minus p. So the whole cone just becomes smaller by p. Uh, so this constraint, which looks quite complicated, it ends up with just uh, subtracting p from here. So the cone kind of shifts forward a little bit. That's it. That's it. That is uh, all there is to it. Beautiful though. Absolutely beautiful. Okay, that is it for the lecture. Uh, if you have any questions, you can ask. You can ask now or you can ask me later, whichever you prefer. Next time, uh, we will uh, continue going into applications. So we have a few more topics with applications. And also we'll have just a couple more topics on uh, the working of convex optimization. So stuff like barrier functions, sensitivity analysis, et cetera. Uh, so we'll have a little bit on those and uh, a little bit on applications. Uh, but that is uh, for uh, the next week. 
This part, by the way, uh, do try to master it on your own because uh, I think I add quite a bit of this uh, in the exams. So just make sure you understand it. This is like one of those simple topics that I uh, feel comfortable giving you as a task on the exam. So you know, just make sure you uh, practice. And it is also extremely useful for robotics specifically because a lot of it uh, is uh, finds direct application on linear control. All right. If you don't have questions, then uh, I'll stop here. We'll see each other on the next Tuesday. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you, Professor. Have a good day. Goodbye. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. Yeah. Goodbye. Goodbye.